This morning we invite you to turn to John the fourth chapter, John chapter 4. And I want to give you a bit of background before we get to the text. Jesus has come, is on his way with his disciples to back to Galilee. And he has come to Samaria, which is unusual because normally the, they would go around Samaria, they wouldn't go through Samaria. But on this particular occasion, Jesus and his disciples are passing through Samaria. And we're told that he comes to Jacob's well. And there he encounters a woman and he asks her for a drink. And she's surprised that he, being Jewish, would even talk with her. But he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And they go on and have a conversation and Jesus tells her things about her life that there's no way that he could have known. And she's so surprised and so impressed with this man that she runs back into town to tell others about the man that she met out at the well. And then in verse 31, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did they? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say, there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages, is in gathering fruit for eternal life, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their harvest. Every year in November here in our country, we celebrate what's known as Thanksgiving. And it's no coincidence that this holiday falls at the end of harvest season. That season is just in the midst, of course, now. Each year as the crops are brought in, we're reminded of, of the God who causes the land to produce the fruit that we receive, who gives us those bountiful blessings. He's the one who sends the rain and the sun on both the just and the unjust. Our Lord saw, though, more than the harvest of fruit and grain. He saw the harvest of souls as he speaks with this woman. And when it comes to this important crop, it's always harvest time. Now, the setting for our text is unique, especially for Jesus' day. When it came to discussing and asking questions, this was done only by men. Women did not participate in public discussion. And this is why Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that women are to keep silent in the churches and if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home. For it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Now I don't think Paul said this because he was a chauvinist. 
He said it because that was the culture in which they were living at the time. That's the way things were done. That was proper etiquette in public. That's not the case in our culture today. Here, though, we find Jesus having a discussion with a woman and a Samaritan woman at that. While his disciples have gone off into town to purchase supplies to help to feed them. Now, this Samaritan is really impressed with Jesus. And she runs off to tell others about her encounter with this unusual man. And I think what you have to picture as our text begins here, as the disciples come back to Jesus with food and urge him to eat, you have to picture that Jesus is looking off in the distance at the town of Samaria and people are coming out of that town. And as those people are coming out of that town and they're asking him to eat, he says, I have food to eat that, that you don't know about. And they're wondering, well, has somebody fed him that we didn't know about here? And then he goes on uh, to explain to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And you can just see the people coming. And as the people get closer, he says, do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? I say, behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, that they are white unto harvest. Maybe he pointed, and it turned their attention to the crowds that were coming. The question that we want to ask today is, what is harvest time? Well, first of all, I would suggest to you that harvest time is a time for zeal. The term zeal speaks of enthusiastic devotion, especially for a cause. You know, harvest time is a time of hard work. If you see some farmers here with us today that look a little haggard, it's because They've been real busy taking in crops. I spoke with one of them this morning that said he's really kind of beat out because he's been busy bringing in the crops. And you know, even though it's hard work and it's intense labor at the time, few farmers complain about bringing in the crops. They may complain about putting them in. They may complain about having to cultivate and fertilize and do all the things to take care of them and keep the weeds out. They might complain about not getting enough grain when it's needed. But the only time you'll ever hear them complain about the harvest is if they can't get it out. They always have an enthusiastic devotion, a zeal, if you would, for the harvest. Now, you know I'm not a farmer. But when we lived in Ohio for several years, we had a rather large garden, garden larger than this room. And we had strawberries and corn and beans and potatoes and tomatoes. Well, we had 50 tomato plants. And you know what? I learned by my experience in gardening that it's a whole lot easier to pick the crop than to put it in and to take care of it. There's always a zeal for harvest. Now, 
That's the kind of zeal that I think Jesus is experiencing here when he talks about his, his enthusiasm for what the fields are like as he looks on these people coming toward him. The disciples are just concerned that Jesus would eat. After all, they'd been traveling for some time. They still had more than a day's journey to go to get up to Galilee. And when Jesus speaks of having food, the disciples are, are puzzled. But for him, doing God's will was his nourishment. This is what refreshed, revived, and strengthened him. His encounter with that one woman had given him vitality and zeal. You remember back when Jesus cleansed the temple early in his ministry, cast out the money changers and turned over their tables and all that happened? It says that John remembered that his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus had zeal for serving the Lord, for doing his will. And he was so excited here about reaching this woman that he lost his appetite for food. Have you ever had that happen? Have you ever worked so hard that you forgot to eat? I've done that before. Just forgot to eat. Well, that's the kind of zeal that you and I need for God's work as well. For the harvest, we need to understand the, the need, the urgency of, of what's before us. We need to look to the harvest with enthusiastic devotion with zeal. Unfortunately, I'm afraid that the church cares about a whole lot of other things more than they care about the harvest of souls. Yeah, we can get real excited about sports teams. We even have a real zeal for potlucks. But where's our zeal for winning the lost? Dwight Moody told this story. He once saw a steel engraving that pleased him so very much. And he said, I thought it was the finest thing I had ever seen. And at the time, and I bought it. It was a picture of a man floundering in the water and clinging with both hands to the cross of refuge. But afterwards, he said, I saw another picture which spoiled this one for me entirely. It was so much more lovely. It was a picture of a person coming up out of the dark waters with one arm clinging to the cross but with the other, she was lifting someone else up out of the waters with her. Harvest time is a time for zeal. Harvest time is also a time for action. You know, it's not a time for those who are lazy or indifferent. When the crop is ready, it has to be harvested. It can't wait or it may get overly ripe and rot. Or the weather may change and you're not able to get into the field. There's no room for procrastination at harvest time. Things have to be done at the proper season. Now this is what Jesus observes here. Notice in verse 35, do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. He's speaking of agricultural things, but he's alluding to a spiritual harvest. 
And I think the crowd of Samaritans that was headed his way was the harvest that he really had in mind. And to Jesus, the harvest was now. Someone once made this comment on this passage. He wrote, not long ago I was riding with a man through the country. Elmer, I said, why are those fields so white? Because the wheat is full grown, he replied. Wheat, I said, I always thought wheat was golden. Yes, it is, he said, except when it's overripe. Then it becomes very light in color. And this is what Jesus meant when he said, the fields are white unto harvest. Friends, we have to realize that this is the condition that we face for the Lord's work today as well. God has called us to action. His work is not accomplished by sitting or by studying or even by praying, just doing those things. We have to get busy and do something. It calls for action. If today is the day of salvation, and that's what the scripture says, then today is also the day of harvest. If we tarry, the harvest will be lost. Some will never hear. It is for those who are both near at hand and for those who are far away that the gospel was intended. Harvest time is a time for action. Harvest time is also a time for laborers. Harvest means work for people. Often extra help is needed to bring in the crops and farmers have to hire extra help to get it all in when they want to get it in. Migrant workers move from south to north in our country helping to harvest the crops of various fields. Without laborers, the crop perishes. Jesus saw this need. He says, those who reap receive wages, verse 36. Already, those who re already he who reaps is receiving wages as it is gathering fruit for life eternal. He's saying workers are needed. And we should be gathering fruit for life eternal. In fact, he commanded us in another passage to pray for laborers. You remember this passage in Matthew 9? Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. You know, Jesus realized that he couldn't do it all by himself. He called 12 others to help him. He realized that even those 12 couldn't do it all by themselves. That everyone they won should be in participation as well. Friends, the preacher can't win the community. The church wins the community. I like what Charles Spurgeon once said when he was asked, how did you get your, your church? He said, I didn't get my church. My church got my church. That's the way God intended for things to be. Everyone should be participating in the task. Everyone should be giving what they can to, to our Lord in his service. Every Christian is a laborer for the harvest. Yes, we must pray for laborers. But we must support those who do labor. That's what our missions projects are all about. We support people in other places 
who are winning the lost. But then we must labor ourselves as well. We can't say, well, I'm praying and I'm giving, so I'm done. It doesn't work that way. The service in a tiny East London mission had ended, and a young doctor was just about to lock the building up for the night. When he noticed a little boy huddling in a corner. He went and questioned him and discovered that the boy had no home. He explained that he slept in a coal bin with some other boys. And the doctor asked the boy to show it to him, so they came to a hole in the wall and the little fellow said, look in there, you'll find them. But the, the coal bin was, was empty. Oh, said the boy, the cops must have come and they left. Follow me, I'll show you where they are. And he led him to a nearby building and there sleeping on a cold tin roof were 13 boys, all homeless. That night, a Christian doctor had his eyes open to the desperate need for a work among children in London. And during the years that followed, he touched the lives of more than 80,000 boys and girls because he saw the need. <coughs> you and I should be gathering fruit for eternal life. Harvest time is a time for laborers. Finally, harvest time is also a time for cooperation. Farmers often cooperate at harvest time. I'm sure many of you know that. We know about how the Amish work together to get their, their crops in from field to field. Oftentimes, farmers will borrow equipment from one another to uh, to get their crops done because they know how important the harvest is. Out in western Kansas, and I've been through this place and seen this happen because I've gotten stuck behind some of this, they do custom combining where maybe 20 or 30 combines will go across thousands of acres of wheat and cut it down because one guy with one combine would never get it all done. It's not a time for bickering over what's more important. It's a time to get things done and to cooperate. Sadly, many a church is bickering over unnecessary things and not doing the work that needs to be getting, that needs to get done. This is a true story I heard from a preacher. He was an evangelist. He came to a church and he noticed how everybody sat on one side and all on the other, you know, every time, every night for the revival. And he didn't say anything. And the preacher finally said something to him. He said, I guess you notice how everybody sits on one side and the other sits on the other side all the time. He said, yeah, I just thought that's where everybody always sits, you know. He said, no, what happened was just a few years ago, we needed a new roof on this building. And some wanted green shingles and some wanted red shingles, so we had a vote. And it was split right down the middle. So we decided to, to shingle one half in red and the other half in green. And so those that voted for the red sit on that side, and those that voted for the green sit on that side. Now that's the kind of ridiculousness the Lord must look down and shake his head and say, what on earth is going on? When it's harvest time, it's time for cooperation, not for bickering over what color shingles go on the church. So we must cooperate in the, in the harvest. Remember what Paul said, 
He who, or the psalmist said, he who goes to and fro weeping and carrying his bag of seed shall indeed come again with a shout of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. That's the way Jesus saw it. He found joy in reaching others. Our challenge is we need to cooperate in the harvest in the same way. Here's what Paul said. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed. Even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted Apollos waters, but God was causing the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. But each will receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are God's fellow workers. Do we really believe that? Are we God's fellow workers? Are we cooperating? We all play a role, whether we plant, whether we cultivate, or whether we harvest. We play a role. And you know what? When the Lord's people are willing to work to get together to accomplish the task, then both churches and individuals will flourish. I like this quotation. I don't know who said it. There are many Christians who are doing nothing, but there are no Christians who have nothing to do. Friends, harvest time is a time of cooperation. You and I are the products of, labor, of the labors of other people. Everybody sitting here this morning is here because somebody else spoke to them about Jesus Christ at one point or another. For me, it's my mom and dad. I was brought up in a Christian home. Maybe some of you were too. Maybe some of you weren't. I know some of you have sketchy backgrounds. Well, the only reason you're here today is because somebody talked to you about your relationship with the Lord. There are some people that only you can reach. And if you don't do it, nobody will. We should have motivation just from that to enter into the great work that God has called us to do in the harvest of souls. We're coming to our time of invitation in just a moment. And we hope that if you're outside the Lord today, that you understand that you need to be a part of that great harvest. You can't be a worker until you've been reaped. You go from being fruit to being a worker in the, in the, in the, in the vineyard, as it were. And so if you're outside of Jesus today, we pray that this might be the time when you decide to come to him and give him your life, confess him before others, and be baptized into Christ. That is the important decision you have to make. Maybe there are other decisions. Maybe you need to commit yourself, in your own head at least, to the harvest and to being a worker for the Lord once again. We all need to do that week by week. Whatever it is, we hope that you will. Let's bow our heads and prepare for our invitation.